wants to die every day. Nobody wants to kill every day. People are, you know, a lot of our communities want to heal. The reason why I'm so excited about this conference is because a lot of times um, when I started working in the judiciary, it was a lot of parent blaming, parent shaming, um, and it would frustrate me because I knew that even if I was a great probation officer, even if I did everything I can do, that means go to the school, right? We go to school and make sure they're doing their attendance, right? Make, making sure that you know they're not truant. Um, even if we make sure that they're going to their drug program, right? Um, even if we make sure that they're going to all their court um, meetings and they're reporting to the office, they might love us and they might you know interact with us on a great, you know, really good level. But if they go back home and things are not going good at home, guess what they're, they're going to do? They're going to escape their circumstances. They are going to go in the streets. They're not going to be able to concentrate at school. They might smoke weed because they want to numb their pain. They might um, be true at school because they can't concentrate. They'd rather go out with their friends. They might run away from home, right? And instead of you know punishing them, because that's sometimes what we're told to do, right, with violations of probation, <coughs> we have to hold them accountable, right? Um, one of my main focuses was, was, well, how about this is that point of intervention? How about let's start engaging the families? And so what I love about this conference is saying empowering families, you know, engaging parents, and all those kind of, um, you know, you know um, words associated with how we can improve our circumstances with our parents, all right? Um, these things I was doing informally, like already. A lot of times what I realized with our parents is that they had issues growing up, and nobody talked to them. You know, a lot of our parents dealt with abuse. A lot of our parents dealt with um, childhood trauma, sexual trauma, and all these kind of things. And they're doing the best they can. And sometimes when they go to court, they get nervous. So a lot of things that I used to do as a probation officer was like, okay, you know what? Let's talk about what you're going to talk about in court. Let's formulate, you know, why we need help for your son. You know, um, and those kind of things. Those kind of things that we don't really get kind of accolades for, right? There's no, you know, kind of guidebook on how to do this, but we know we have to do, do this, and we know that the parents are the integral part, and we know that they do care. Even the ones that seem, you know, kind of disenchanted with the system, they do care about the circumstances of their kids. So it's so important for us, um, you know, and the work we do in engaging them. Going on my, 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 my face, but I would shoot at people and hope that I killed them. I hope that the parents went through the same kind of mental anguish that I was going through as a child. So I was doing adult things still in a child state of mind. That's the population that y'all working with. But how many of y'all went through these courses and got jobs that y'all have? How many of y'all actually got these lesson plans? That's the scary part. How many people actually did internship work in those communities before y'all saw work in those communities? It will make it that much easier. It makes it that much easier to actually go to college, get the work done, go to academy, go get the training that you need, whether it's probation officer, whether it's legal counseling, whether it's a judge, whether it's a, um, a CO, a police officer, it doesn't even matter. Make them do about five to six months in that community that you know you're gonna sign them to. They get familiar with the kids it becomes that much easier to say, listen, Jojo, put down the gun. <coughs> and they respect him because they've been working with him. He might have taught Jojo how to shoot a basketball, how to swing his first bat, how to talk to a girl, how to tie his shoes. That's how it works. That's why it's easy for me to talk to him because I've done these things. Police wasn't around to do it. The firemen wasn't around to do it. When I was younger, the firemen used to engage with us. We used to be able to go to the, um, the station, play with the door, slide down the pole, ring the bell, go all through the, the fire truck, and we, we had such a love and connection with them. I wanted to be a fireman all my life. The police officer was a little different. <laughs> <laughs> My first encounter, my first encounter, like, you know, in a negative way with the police, I was 14 years old, because for years, they used to come to our school and say, they're going to protect us from the bad guys, we know it's hard for y'all, there's drug dealers out here, and this, and this, and this, and we used to be like, you know what, yeah, this feel good. I wanted to tell them what's going on in my house, because they say they protect me, but I know if it don't work out, I'm going to get my ass whipped in the house, so I'm just not going to say nothing. And then... I didn't know that the police were going to have that same idea 
when I came of age. So when I became 14, the same person that they was talking about protecting me from, in their eyes, I became. And I didn't do anything wrong yet. We used to take the scenic route. We used to take the scenic route um, to avoid other gangs and crews because I've been robbed countless times when I was uh, young, 11, 12 years old. We you know certain neighborhoods didn't like my projects because my projects was bad. And they did things to their peers, their uncles and stuff like that. So I was wearing the name of where I was from. So I would go the scenic route because when I try to take the regular route, where everyone goes, where adults are at, adults didn't help me when someone used to pull my, my, my pockets like this, out, like rabbit ears, you should call them rabbit ears. They used to do this. They take all the money out, the change out that's in your pocket at 12 years old, take your bus pass, and they will rabbit ear your pockets and make you walk home like that to show everyone in the neighborhood that you just been pumped and that you ain't gonna do nothing about it. And the adults that used to watch it didn't do anything about it. No one helped us. And the only reason why that kid did it because it was done to him. That's the only way you see it. Nobody's seen it on TV. You have to actually live it to see that kind of stuff. I see some of my peers get shot dead. We were taking the scenic route and I froze. I froze, and after, after, after they were shot, the, the, the shooter smoothly walked past me and said, your fucking ass is next if you say anything. Like, I shoot you dead just like your friend. I don't even know why he did it. Caught for any crime until I was 26 years old. That's after being on a run for four and a half years for, on Delaware's Most Wanted list. I started self-mutilating because of all the trauma that was going on through my head. Self-mutilation at the age of either eight or nine years old, where I used to play with soccer and shock myself. Where I used to, um, um, I, didn't, I wasn't cutting yet. I used to burn my arms over stove. I used to bite myself until I bled because when I used to go to sleep, this man, this monster, used to wake me up in, my, in the middle of my, uh, my sleep, pounce on me, bust the lip. He never, he never would blacken my eye. He blacked my mother's um, eyes, eyes a lot, because I, I guess he figured I had to go to school. But he'll bruise all my body, you know, do, do, do things that, like, psychologically, like, you know, mess me up. Mm -hmm. 10 years old, I, you know, I seen it on TV before, but, you know, I didn't think people still did that kind of stuff where at, at the age of eight or nine years old, you can actually sit down in a chair, place me over his lap, pull down my pants, and actually like give me a whipping because that's what his parents did to him. But when I went to school and I'm talking to my, my, my peers, they're not relating the same situation. They're not talking about how their fathers shot up. Heroin. They're not talking about how, how crack smells because it's in the house. They're not doing the same things I'm doing. So the first thing that happened for me was I, I became an outcast. And for years, I thought it was no place for outcasts. But it was. Gangs are outcasts. Gangs are outcasts from their families, society, the system. We already feel that y'all don't like us as it is. So it's hard to even talk to y'all. We have a whole bunch of distrust issues. The first teachers that we have are our mother and father. They failed us. They have failed us completely. So the second, you know, like, you know, surrogate mother or father is the system. And when the system fails you, all hope is gone. So it's easy for somebody to say, you know, trust in the Lord and, you know, everything is going to be all right and I don't see it. Your blessings are coming, but I'm, I'm telling you I'm hurting, but you don't see it. I know 
I can walk into a room right now and it could be a group of kids. I know the sounds of hunger pains. I know how it looks. I know exactly how it looks. So I'm able to reach those kids really quick. They're able to recognize me really quick. I don't have to say I'm from the projects to recognize somebody else from the projects because the words that we talk about is going to, no matter what part of the country you're in, it's going to be similar. So if you weren't from there, it's a disconnection. It's like, I can't trust this person. I can't trust this person. I remember my mother used to get laid out. My father would lay out. The next time she woke up would be the next morning. This happened so often in my life, I don't, I don't even, I can't even comprehend why it was happening. It just was just normal to me. So what used to happen often was cops used to come to the house. But when they knocked on the door, my mother would threaten me. And if she thought I was like nervous or shaky about it, she'd tell my ass to go to sleep. Because I wasn't supposed to say anything to police officers. And this is at the age of five, the age of four, the age of six, the age of seven. This is what I was taught by my mother. And my mother been working for the health department for 35 years. My mother graduated from Cornell University, top of the line. Smart woman. She used to take those beatings, support the whole family, and the only reason she stayed with him is because she seen the rest of my friends without a father, so she thought that that was the best way so I won't die because that's all that was happening. They were dying in the streets, and the first thing he was saying was, that's because they don't have no fathers, or the fathers are dead or in jail. So she thought that was the way out, to take the abuse, to keep my father in my life so I can survive and not go to jail or prison or die. That's was her thought process. No matter how smart she was, that's exactly what she thought. So when the police used to come to the house, she already had everything laid out. She would tell me, run in the back, get the blankets, and she would throw sheets and blankets over all of our property. I didn't, know, I didn't understand why until later on that she was actually covering any type of incriminal things and that the police can't look it over because they come here just to observe the, uh, the situation. She would say nothing happened. She would say, and, and they would tell her the same thing. We can't do anything unless you say something is wrong. And she already know that they can't speak to me because I'm a minor and I'm in her care. So when we talk about justice, like, like Lisa was just saying, it's really funny how a police officer can come into the house, know something is wrong, see a child there, know something is wrong, and then go about his day. I missed almost half of my, 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 my first and second grade school year because my father used to take, take me out of school because he thought that, you know, ripping running the streets with me, he was teaching me something. So the school would, would, would say I was missing all these classes and I was gonna get left back. So my mother got this notification. The school knew something was wrong. When I used to go to gym class, I used to fight because I had holes in my socks. I used to get in trouble and, and get sent to the principal office because I was not going to be humiliated, out, like, you know, I'm, I'm made fun of because I had holes in my socks. So I'm not taking off my sneakers for gym. I'm just not. If that made me a bad child, if that, if, 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 if that made the system say that I, needed, um, um, I had ADHD and I had all these problems, so be it. But I wasn't going to be embarrassed by my peers and end up fighting when the teacher's not looking because that's what's going to happen. It was embarrassing to go up, to go to go into the classroom. It's super quiet because the teacher's talking, or she's telling us to think about something, and your stomach growls so loud that the whole damn class can hear it. It'll make you want to fight somebody. It'll make you want to fight somebody, and that's at the age of six, seven, eight, all these young ages. So by the time, if the system doesn't get in place like they should have, by the time I get to 17, 19 years old. I've already encountered a gun and knife. I don't have a problem shooting somebody because I think I can do it already. I'm already mad enough. I'm petrified of my father. I'm confused when my mother stays with him. That's not the life of no human being. No human being. And it's weird because I used to watch this woman say, watch TV and it'll be 
you know, this this commercial on on um, Africa or something like that. And you know, the the kid have a you know a big belly because he was starving and stuff like that. And she was like, oh, you know, that's crazy. You know, you know, she wants to help them so much. And I'm looking at her like, but we need help, and you're not trying to help us. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Why why is it like this? Does she does she hate me because I'm 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 his child? Like I you know all this confusion can cause a lot of psychological problems. Never knew I had mental health issues because depression wasn't talked about. So when y'all talk about reimagining justice and actually doing something for these kids, you have to know exactly where they come from. So by the time I get to you at the age of 15, how can you help me now? Because nothing in your rules and regulations in your system is saying that you can help me. Nothing in those books, because I worked for child welfare before. I've been in the system before. Nothing that, anything that y'all said can help me. I do the right thing for the moment because I'm in your face. But when I get back home, what am I supposed to do? I joined the game because I needed, I needed, I needed some type of structure in the family. I needed that, so I joined the game. They provided that type of love. They provided that void that I needed. Unfortunately, it came with, you know, some cons. It came with jail, shooting people. It came with losing friends and lives. That's what it came with. But for an individual, a human being that has never had that before, I'll take that love and take all of the consequences and the obligation that come with it. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? It's really, really scary. It's really scary for those kids and those shots out there. Think about your family members right now. Think about all your family members right now. Think about if any of y'all have kids right now, they're not going through any of this stuff. So imagine them being put in my situation. Your children being put in my situation. You gotta have a heart. You gotta have the stomach for it, you gotta have the heart for it. So the disconnection, see no one's saying that get them off scot free. No one is saying that at all. What I'm trying to say is don't make them monsters. For years, I called myself a monster. It's because everyone else called me a monster. Everyone else said I was crazy, so I said I was crazy. Everyone else said I was a badass, so I said I was a badass. That's what that that was my name. That was the label I got pla I got placed with. But now when I work in the system, I'm realizing that that's the way the system thinks. That we're servicing little monsters. Manipulation, fear that people put in kids and adults in our community. So when we get up in front of a judge and they saying like, you know, you can do life in prison, you can do this, it's like, I'm already doing life in prison. You can't tell me nothing new. I'm gonna see my peers in there. You're not telling me not anything new. Nothing new. So when we say reimagining justice, I'm asking y'all, think outside the box and how are you going to save me? That's what y'all need to learn. How are you going to save me? Because guess what? I'm the professor. I'm the teacher. And all those kids that you try to save, if I didn't rectify my life, there's no way hell that y'all can match up to me. No way. You can give them all the scholarships in the world, give them a big house, a car. You can change their whole environment. Once I get a hold of him, whatever I put in his brain is going to stay in his brain. And he's going to do whatever I say. If I say destroy, he's going to destroy. If I say leave your parents alone, he's going to leave his parents alone. Y'all have a big and hard job. I cannot do it by myself, but I need y'all to be on board. I need y'all to understand what y'all actually facing and what y'all need to do. It's a lot of people out here that, that don't want this to happen. So um, thank you for listening to us.